Hi, good afternoon. Um, and good afternoon to our audience. Um, and welcome to this session on thoughts on the glass ceiling breakers or a discussion with some trailblazers in your community. Um, I'm Lieutenant General Mary Legere. I am a managing director from Accenture. And I'm just thrilled to be here to be I'm very honored as an intelligence professional to be um, here today to introduce you to three really extraordinary women who have been trailblazers in this profession and who have stories to share. So for those of you who have joined us first and foremost, let me thank you. I know you had a really hard choice. There was a really fun session that had something to do with Zumba or whatever, uh, but I'm glad that substantively those of you who are seeking to think about how you navigate your careers and have an opportunity in a rare opportunity to see three of the real giants in this community share their own experiences. I'm glad that you decided to join us. Um, I'd like to also uh, just commend um, this great uh, association. Um, as an intelligence professional, I come from my own tribe and I understand how important it is uh, for the professional development and mentorship of every echelon of the profession. And this is a fantastic um, annual event. And it's very clear as someone who is geeky enough to go through every single part of your agenda that you have brought in your heaviest hitters to really help inspire and empower and certify those that are going to take the helm and lead the country in these really important functions. So thank you for letting me be part of it. Um, and then to all of you who are out there, um, I am not part of your tribe. I am someone that has been taken care of. Although I did share with one of our guests, I figured out our timeline. I was audited uh, by one of the people and, and it came out fine. Uh, but um, I, I, as an intelligence professional, um, what you really come to appreciate very on, early on in your career is it takes a village for you to do your job in the Department of Defense and in the government. And from my earliest days in my earliest um, contact with finance officers and finance experts, it's, it was actually a six foot seven uh, finance NCO that escorted me to do a payment of $57,000 to a field artillery battery where I, as a lieutenant with about six months in service, was going to actually perform the payment. This was before obviously online banking, and it was before uh, automated transactions. Um, but from that day of, as a platoon leader with 58 to the time that I left the Army after 34 years in charge of a 57,000 person um, you know, enterprise of the Intelligence Corps and billions and billions of dollars worth of modernization fund money to take care of, um, I have always been well taken care of by the professionals that grow up in your community. Um, the humility, um, the patience, um, the sternness at times of helping people like me who have a profession that is not your own stay inside the rumble strips of excellence, be part of a responsible government, be, be part of a responsible Department of Defense. So I don't get to play it forward very often, but I wanted to say thank you. The vision of that paymaster experience so that terrorizing day when I got a two-star command and they said, hey, congratulations on your new Intel command. It's going to be fun. It's like Disneyland. But you are also the head of a contracting activity with $11 billion worth of contracts. And I was like, wait, what? And it was literally your profession that came in and for weeks trained me on what I was going to need to know to stay in to help the Army have the capabilities that it needed because it was being by led by a leader who was informed by experts. So thank you. I called my uh, former RM to tell him that I had made the big time and they actually were letting me moderate. He said, wait, what? Um, <laughs> he said, he said ma'am, please don't embarrass me. We took very good care of you. So a shout out to that general officer. I am proud to say that I had uh, two RMs and financial uh, uh, ABOs go on to be generals who managed to pass through my way. So either they kept me straight or I took care of them. But anyway, thrilled to be here. Um, so how's this panel going to work? We have three amazing women who ha are going to tell their stories. 
And I'm going to cue them up with a little bit about where they came from and why, at what point, whether they were three, five, or seven, did they realize they would be world leaders and they would own things. Uh, but I'm going to ask them a little bit about what they were like when they were young. Then I'm going to transition to a question that's going to help them understand how they navigated their career. Was it serendipitous, um, like a feather on the wind? Or were they deliberately involved being mentored or mentoring themselves as many women in our professions at my age and certainly potentially at yours? Um, not a lot of mentorship until a certain point when it may kick in. So I want to hear from them so you can hear from them and learn how they managed to create this body of work that has led them to these positions. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the topic because while this is a profession that is dominated at the lower echelons by amazing men and women and predominantly women, as the pyramid, you know, extends to the tip, there are fewer by percentage women in leadership positions. So there is a glass ceiling and there is a point where we have to acknowledge that because if we don't acknowledge it, can't really address it. So I would like to get their perspectives on that. So we'll transition to that. And I'm telling the audience this because I want you to be prepared that when we get done with that, we're going to be opening it up to questions for you in at least a minute. So that's our game plan. Um, I'm hoping this is going to be a free flow conversation. I'll start now by introducing the woman uh, very briefly. You'll notice, and my husband was amazed by the talent here. Husband is a former army officer and also a member of Army Cyber Command. And he was looking at the names first and foremost, sends his regards, but he said there are more uh, vowels on the sheet of all the women that are here than he's ever seen in his life. So that's just an engineer's observation of this. But I'm gonna begin with our first uh, guest who is joining us by phone. Alale Jenkins, who many of you know, particularly those of you who are from the Navy and Department of Defense. Alale right now is, is, is the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Financial Management and Comptroller. Um, in that capacity, she kind of is overseeing the budget and management of the Department of the Navy's billion dollar annual budget and all of its supporting processes. And she is also, as a common theme in her career, uh, spearheading the financial management transformation that is ongoing across the, the Navy, the Marine Corps, DFAS, which should be of interest to all of us, including veterans, as well as a number of defense agencies that turn to the Navy for executive agencies. So to Alale, welcome. Um, she has an interesting background. Also, she'll talk a little bit. I'm not going to cover everything. You can pull up their resumes, but she did spend some time in OSD Comptroller, which is uh, something that she has in common with Mubala. Um, she, has an ex she has some experience as the, the um, Chief Management Officer for the Department of the Navy. She served uh, as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Financial Management and Operations. So I don't know, Mabala, do you get a lot of extra direction from her since she had the job before? I don't know. Share. <laughs> um, Deputy CFO. And really, uh, as I asked one of our experts in your profession, like, what are all the key components of the all-stars and every every aspect of this profession uh, you know, Alale has spent some time um, at, at the highest level. She became an SCS, I think, in 2012. And I'll stop there to let her talk a little bit about when she, when she's ready. She came to the government from industry, um, as did all three all three of our um, panelists. So, Alale, welcome. And I know how busy you are right now. Um, and I'm like absolutely amazed that we have the the. Two, two of the most powerful people in the Navy um, who control all the money. So if anything's happening at the Pentagon that matters right now, uh, I'm hoping that we, uh, you know, they're, they're all acting in good faith with you. Your, par your partner and in, in teammate at, um, at the Navy is our second guest. And uh, Ms. Mobala Kadiri, uh, this, the, also a, de a Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Financial Operations. In this capacity, um, she is responsible for Navy Department of the Navy's accounting and financial management matters and in inst instituting and evolving the policies that oversee those procedures, as well as dealing with any of the great ideas from DOD that would impact the way you do your job. And I'm sure it's quite creative. Now, 
you deserve it because you served there at OSD as well. And you made somebody in your job's life miserable. So it all goes <laughs> you, well two have some, <laughs> you two have some experience at OSD. And I think that might be really interesting to comment on how in both cases you served up and then went back down to the Navy, giving you a perspective of what to expect and how to interact. And that might be a, a great point to mention. Um, prior, you made SES. I noticed at one point when you were at OSD and you were doing uh, auditing, um, I was probably one of your audits. Um, I'm, it just, I, again, had I had you as my financial advisor, perhaps I wouldn't have been there. But uh, in any event, prior to 2012, which was uh, at the time that you made SES, um, you also had a few other assignments in the Navy. And what's really interesting to an Intel professional is you spent some time at the Department of Treasury. And you were responsible for, you know, reconciling treasury warrants now to an Intel professional that's followed the money so we can put a strike on you. But for you, it's a little less dramatic. And yet uh, that aspect of Department of Treasury of ensuring that uh, warrants and reconciliation of those uh, payments are incredibly important. And in that experience, you got to work across the federal agency, which I'm sure was one of those transformative assignments. Um, you also started with industry, so I'll let you share that story. Um, and then finally, someone that I've been dying to meet um, because um, Margaret is actually part of the Accenture team. Um, we have Accenture Federal, which focuses on the federal government. We have Accenture Global, which focuses on the world and largely our commercial practices. And Margaret is a superstar. Mar Margaret Weicker is a superstar in Accenture Global in North America. She has 25 years of experience in the commercial sector, but had a really important stop with the government. And those of you who are in the government probably recognize the name because she served as the deputy director for the office of the director of management for OMB. Um, three initials that bring fear in the hearts of all senior people. Uh, so Margaret, it's good to have you as a, as a teammate now. Uh, Margaret's career is fascinating to me because she is one, right now she's leading our North America's payment practice. And it looks like she's kind of a superstar in this sector. She'll tell, talk to you more about it, but her career is consistently revolving around doing really impactful things, um, not only for her customers at banks and consulting firms, but also creating innovation to improve the way that entire process is experienced. So she, if we were to ask the trivia question, who on the panel has patents? Uh, Mark, Martha has 14 of them. So don't leave her with anything that you want to get back in the same shape you had before. I think if you invited her to your house, she might rewire it. So Margaret's got one of those innovators brains that is in a career field that requires that kind of energy. So Margaret, I'm thrilled to meet you. I've heard so much about you. Those are our three panelists, ladies, thank you. Um, you all have come to this point as leaders onto this panel to talk to your community. Um, and you have many things in common and you have a few things in different, but one thing you do have is you've all served your country. You have all served um, our nation, whether in private sector or as part of the government to ensure the democracy that we have with the transparency in government is protected by the professionals that have your skill sets. So I wanna thank you as somebody that comes from a high compliance uh, career field, um, but not as high compliance as yours. Uh, we get a little bit of flexibility. We don't always know where the enemy is. You know where everything is. So I wanna thank you for your service on behalf of all of us. And then uh, without further ado, just jump into your stories. So I'm gonna go in the order I introduced you this time and next time I'll just be bumping one over. So don't be surprised. So the first thing we wanna do is just have a window into the world of what, Alayla, what, what were you like when, in all of you, what were you like when you were little? At what point did you realize people were gonna be turning to you for direction? Describe yourself as a young person and what was the point or what was the influence that said, I think I'm gonna pursue a career in this profession? So over to you, Alayla. Thank you, Mary. I really appreciate uh, um, this opportunity to be on this panel with this amazing women panelists. Um, and uh, I appreciate the, the kind uh, remarks and the introduction. 
Um, this topic is very near dear to my heart. Um, and um, while I enjoy being at the Pentagon and talking about budget and audit all day, this is, uh, this is very important to me. Um, I have a very interesting uh, background and story that uh, I always appreciate the opportunity to share um, for the next generation as they step into this organization. And I want them to uh, perhaps use leverage um, and remember. Um, so uh, for me, um, you know, I've had the blessing of having the right sponsors throughout my career um, and being in the position that I am today. Um, but um, there were some um, characteristics or the, the learnings I have um, gotten uh, through, um, you know, through my life, uh, which has been um, kind of changing how I, see, um, how I see the world, the career, and where I want to go. Uh, so I'd like the opportunity to share that, uh, share that with you all. So um, for me, I'm the first generation immigrant in my family uh, coming to the United States at age 18 um, and uh, came in to this country. And uh, as I've said before, in uh, different venues and different uh, panels that I've been on, um, probably that was the, the um, changing uh, moment in my life um, as I came into a new culture, a new country, no language, no money. Um, and, and you soon realize that um, this is about um, surviving. Um, it started from a survivorship, but growing up, one of the things that I learned, and it was kind of the principles in my family, was um, um, value for hard work. Um, I would say discipline. Um, so being organized, being disciplined. Um, understanding that um, uh, you have to take care of yourself. Um, and I would say I'm also, I call it determination. And my parents probably would call me stubborn. Uh, so whether we're calling it being stubborn or being determined, uh, that actually helped me because um, there was no way that I was going to take um, a failure. Um, and at the same time, although it was hard, it was extremely hard, um, what I did not want to have is the victim mentality. Um, later, we're going to talk about kind of lessons learned and perhaps in hindsight, looking back, um, while I helped myself to a high standard, sometimes I was too tough on myself. Um, and that's one of the lessons learned I got. But I kind of carry that through. It started with, hey, I got to survive. I have a mission. I have to go to school. I have to get accustomed to the culture, to this new living. And that soon turned into, I want to move up. There is nothing that will stop me. And I have all the opportunities available to me. And I have all the power within me to move up. So going from kind of the school to then career. And that has continued throughout my career. And um, again, I've been blessed to be given opportunity to where I am, but um, I, there was a lot of um, sweat and tears that went into it as well. And um, there was nothing to stop me as, um, as I went through um, kind of my life here and through the uh, career advancement. Yeah, so Layla, one question, just real short of what, what did you decide to study in, in college and, and what was your favorite subject? Uh, well, very interesting you say that. I Quite frankly, I keep thinking about, so my father, uh, you know, was a, uh, was a doctor, right? Um, and uh, my, uh, my siblings, the older ones, they all, you know, became engineers. And my, my father's hope for me was that, you know, I kind of carry that, that same, uh, you know, carry on and uh, become a doctor. So growing up, you know, every summer I would go to his office and learn. And that's what I want it to be. I want it to be in medicine, you know, the, the life saving lives, helping people matter. And somehow, quite frankly, Mary, I don't know how I ended up being an accountant. Um, I think part of that, again, is that lack of patience that I had. As I, you know, came to the country, I was like, what's the fastest way that I can get through college, get a job, you know, be on my own, and right? And, and quite frankly, part of it also was, you know, the fear 
A, I didn't have the financial stability to put myself through a four year of college and then go yeah. to medical school. And so that's how I got blessed with, okay, maybe the accounting is the route, uh, is the route I want to go. But one thing I did know at that point was that I wanted to join a CPA firm. Because I knew that coming in, uh, you know, with a degree in accounting, I have to you, be a CPA. You'd have a and job, yeah. To, yep. Yeah, and I wanted so I'm to gonna, work. Yeah, so I'm yeah, going to stop you so we don't go too far into your story. Um, but so the nice thing is, is that anybody dies of shock when you tell them how much you're going to cut their budget, you might have some medical skills. So there's a, <laughs> there's a possibility that they won't, if they're going to pass out in your office, they might survive the experience. Well, thank you for that. So I'm going to go to Mobala and I'm going to ask you the same question. What were you like? Where were you when you were five years old? Oh my God. Like yeah. as a kid so that thanks, led you um, to be here. Yeah, th thank you for the opportunity, and I, I'm definitely uh, honored to be a part of the panel. Um, when you say where I was when I was five, um, interesting, takes me back um, quite a while now. Um, my story is a little, a little similar, uh, but nothing, a little similar to Alali as we talk about background. And uh, my parents um, were immigrants of this country, and I think my parents had come here for college and uh, from Nigeria. And so at age five, I was born in Washington, DC, but at age five, my parents were relocating back to Nigeria. So they had come over here, they had gotten to the education. And I think the next phase for them was to go back home, take that home and try to make the country better. So at age five, I was relocating to Nigeria. Um, I remember I remember that as a kid, I was, um, when I got to Nigeria, things were a little bit different. Um, I was one of those kids you would call big mouth, even till now people say it, right? I was one of those kids that needed to be heard. I was really inquisitive, so I would ask questions forever. And, um, and, I, and when I was passionate about something, there was no stopping me as a kid. So Mabola at five was that kid who got in a lot of trouble, Mabola at 10, Mobola as a teenager was terrible because I still got in trouble because every time I was in class and, and think about it, there are cultural differences, right? So in Nigeria, you could think a lot of things, but you don't, you know, as a kid, you don't tell a lot of things to adult. And that wasn't me. And thankfully I had, I had a, I had a dad who encouraged me to do that. And a mother who always stopped me from doing so much of that, right? There had to be boundaries. So that, so that was kind of me was always, um, and so if I was in class and um, a teacher was teaching something and I didn't think it made sense, or I felt like I wanted to challenge the status quo, well, you don't really do that in Nigeria. You got in trouble. So I got in a lot of trouble. But I that, auditor, say, that auditor in you is coming out to say, I think. <laughs> yeah. And so, so I, think, I think for me, um, even as a grown up, even today, I kind of see where those traits um, may have helped me develop into who I am today, you know. Well, you sound... Challenge in the status quo in a lot of the things that we do, and that's pretty much, you know, growing up, that was something that I I always did. I just was very curious. Well, you sound pretty fearless, um, and I'll just Thank read you. the quote. Cheryl Sandberg bailed us all out when she said, you know, girls that who were described as bossy when they were little yeah, really have been described as leaders. So as somebody that was, that was, that was invited to self-pace myself through sixth grade because my teacher was moving too slowly through the curriculum, you and I need to talk because we probably <laughs> have experiences. Uh, but thank you to your parents for finding that balance of taking a child who started in America and then was brought back into a culture where there were certain um, probably expectations for how young ladies can form. And your dad signaled to you and your mom looked the other way while you held on to who you were, because where you are today is a lot of who you were at that age. Margaret, your story, I just want to hear why we went to Georgetown and ended up here. But I want you to tell your story. Margaret, who are you at five and what were you like as a kid? And when did you know that you would basically be saving my life 25 years later? Because had you been born before me? I would never had to be a pay officer, which was fun. <laughs> so, in any so, event. I, I love this question, and it, it brought a smile to my face. You know, I, I wrote down, you know, in preparing, you know, 
I wrote down three words. Curiosity was top of the list, perseverance, and sense of humor. What I will say that the image that comes together for me is all about keeping up with my brother. So my brother is 11 months older than me. And in the cultural background I have, that's called an Irish twin. And, and it meant that uh, we were pretty much here our whole lives, but he was older and he was doing all the things I wanted to be doing. And so I, I mean, probably even before five was always trying to keep up with him. And I think because of the curiosity, I wanted to be right there. And the reason the sense of humor was important was you can imagine, you know, maybe not so much at five, but when I was eight and he was nine or I was nine and he was 10, he wasn't that keen on having his little sister around. And so I needed to both be persistent, but also get along in a way so I was, you know, able to be part of, of whatever was going on. And I found that actually through humor. You know, I would cut up a little bit. I would, you know, make my brother's friends want to not kick me out of the tree fort or whatever the expedition was. And it's something that's been important to me. Um, it, you know, it keeps me humble so that I don't become that word that, you know, if men are a certain kind of way, they don't get described as shrill or, you know, bossy or whatever those things are. The more I use humor to share the same concepts and also not get super defensive myself, the better outcomes I had from age five on. So I, I, I just have, my nickname back then was Peggy. I just have, I had the, you know, the handlebar pigtails and everything. It brought a smile to my face thinking about it. Well, thank you for that. Well, thank you for that. Um, and to all of you, thank you for giving us just a little bit of snapshot and in, in getting to know you beyond the picture. So I'm getting really good cues from um, the team to say, hey, move on because we want to hear the story. So we're going to fast forward to your careers. I'm going to start uh, Mabola with you and ask you to say, at what point did you begin? You started in uh, an accounting firm and then you transitioned to government, which was a hard turn. Um, at one point in your, your career, did you start managing uh, the different progressions in your job? Was it deliberate? Did you have kind of a plan? And as you think about that question, um, what kind of advice would you give uh, the people that are listening to say, I would like to achieve what she's achieved. I'd like to understand how did she know when to move, when to leave a job, when to go from private sector to the government? So thanks for that question. So from my... So I'd say I've evolved um, quite a while. I think um, I think when I was um, younger and new to the career, I had a plan, right? I had a specific plan. I was going to do private sector. I was going to get to a specific level before I started a family because I figured I could better manage that. So for for quite some time, I was very structured. When I was with um, when I was with the accounting firms. Um, Yes, I was very structured on what I wanted, when I wanted it, long hours I needed to put in, people I needed to shadow, what I needed to do. And I think that's a really good foundation for a lot of people. Uh, people, you know, some people tend to shy away from that experience. I think that experience, to be honest with you, is one of the best foundational things that's happened to me because you you gain so much depth and breadth of, um, of what you do from an accounting standpoint. And I think it serves as a stepping stone to, for other things that you could do. So with that, um, up until I left Deloitte, I was pretty calculated on what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. And uh, my goal always was always to be, um, you know, was, you know, kind of not, I wouldn't say overachiever per se, but it was the passion and I had to keep growing. So for me, it was about, yep, I'm going to make this position in less years, right? So for me, it wasn't the status quo of, oh, spend two years here, spend three years here, spend, you know, it wasn't that. It was just I had a goal and I was going for the goal. And I must say, I had been fortunate enough 
throughout my career, even when I joined the government, which was harder to get like, you know, a mentor sponsorship. But but as I as I went on in my career, even within the government, I was blessed to have some of those people who even when I got scared, they weren't right. Because there are times when you do get scared when you're about to, you know, go into that next phase and you know you could do it. But you're so as it gets realer, you get a little more, you know, a little scared and go, hey, am I really going to do this? And I think everyone needs that person, right, who looks at you and say, you better go for it because you are not, because all these people here are not any better. And when you look back, you should be setting an example, pulling people, helping them gain that confidence. So you need to go for it. So th throughout my career, at some point before I joined the government, I was very calculated. When I joined the government, um, I found myself in situations sometimes that I didn't think was, um, you know, some, sometimes outside my comfort zone. And for me, what I learned was I may not have had the sexiest task assignment, but it was really about what I made of it. And with the right leadership, mentorship, what you made of it became more transparent and people started to believe, oh, well, and so as opportunities came up and I met and, and, and was blessed enough to have people who helped me as I managed my career, helped me and provided opportunities. And I was ready again, for those type of things, you have to be ready for the conversations. Sometimes they're pleasant, sometimes they're not. If you have a mentor who tells you great stuff all the time about yourself and you don't have anything to work on, you may need another one. So there were times when the, the conversations were tough. They were things I needed to hear, things I needed to do, you know, and understanding my weaknesses and saying, what do I do, right? And how, and, and so for me, it's been kind of, um, did I manage it? Yes. At some point, was it programmed? Yes. But at some point, I let those relationships that I cultivated along the way help me kind of bolster my career um, as I was blessed, again, to have mentors and sponsors that really cared. Well, it does sort of, it's a continuity from the way you were as a child. If you're not afraid of something, maybe your goals aren't big enough. I think somebody, I think someone has said that, that yeah. if, if you're comfortable, then maybe you're you're not challenging yourself enough. Margaret, you obviously had, you know, a, an exceptional career going, but you've made a couple really hard turns from foreign service to school of economics to tell us a little bit about your career. How, when did you start managing it? pretty deliberately and, um, you know, what did it teach you? Yeah, it, a great question. Um, like Alala, when I was younger, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. Um, and it was mostly because that's what smart girls wanted to be. And when I wrote my essays, um, I knew I wanted to go to Georgetown and there's a whole host of reasons I wanted to go to Georgetown that included 18 year old drinking age and lots of other not particularly professional things. But I realized when I wrote my essay for the School of Foreign Service, which I thought was going to be easier to get into than the pre-med program, which is not empirically true, I actually believed what I wrote about, you know, the School of Foreign Service. And it was, it was a great decision, you know, when I got in that that was a fit for me. And what my experience, I think, soup to nuts has been, and I can tell a very long-winded story about the connections between each of my decisions. If I'm intellectually challenged and growing, I can see a breadth of opportunity and have options about what I do next. And so I've had thoughts about what I do very next, you know, first and foremost, having a job is about paying for things. So I've never been, you know, like finding myself when it comes to paid employment. Um, you know, the more unpleasant the job, typically the more you get paid for it. So I've, I've done all kinds of things, but mostly I've said yes to new opportunities. And it has meant there are times when I may not be the most well prepared, but I've learned a, a, a couple of things. I've learned how to learn, which has been maybe the skill that's been most important, not any of the specifics, you know, functionally um, or even, uh, you know, from a subject matter expertise. It's how to learn, 
how to constantly be learning is maybe the most important trait. And then asking for help and looking for teams, you know, whether they're formal teams or, you know, teams of allies to help me succeed. And, you know, it, in a couple of cases, I've needed a lot of help even to make the decisions about, is this a good idea? And I have to say that the decision to go into government was probably the toughest decision I had ever made. Some of you may know a little bit of my story, but, um, you know, a college friend from the School of Foreign Service asked me to join an administration that I hadn't voted for, um, for a party that was not the party of my affiliation. And every part of that decision felt hard. It's the most meaningful work I've had the privilege to do and be part of your community. And I would absolutely do it again. Um, so I think it's that intellectual curiosity, spirit of learning, and then saying yes. You know, I've said yes to a lot of strange things. And, you know, I loved what Mavola said about making the opportunity really the thing. Because if somebody's tapping me, it's probably because they need me. And even if I don't like what the thing is, the opportunity, I can make it something that I could like by doing something with that role. So, um, um, yeah. You got it's just like a master class. There's so many great ideas here about just embracing that thing that is feels foreign but will will force you to grow. So thank you for sharing that. Um I was, I was glad you shared how you made the decision to go from commercial to government at such a high level. That's that's daunting to think about. Um, so thank you for sharing that as well. We might get some questions from the audience about that. Alayla, tell us uh, a little bit about as you managed your career, you landed in and there is this unbelievable determination to continue to excel and reach your potential. How did you manage your career? And if you were giving advice, you know, to others that are saying it's serendipitous or I'm going toward the hardest jobs, what, 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 what would be the advice you give to, to the audience? Thanks, Mary. Um, very interesting. As I'm listening to Margaret and Mavola, I can relate to so many things that both of them mentioned. Um, one of the things, one of the principles that I've always had is if you don't ask for it, you won't get it. Um, so I did not have also any necessarily a planned career, but um, one thing was... Um, what I did not want to do is be in the status quo and um, be in my comfort zone. And as uncomfortable as things uh, seem like, as daunting, um, is I leaned in. Um, I remember when the opportunity came up um, for the principal deputy assistant secretary of the Navy for financial management, um, my initial reaction was, oh my God, this is going to oversee the budget. This is going to, and I don't have it. But then I was like, you know what? I am, I can do this. I've got the qualities and the capabilities and I can compete as well as anybody else. So I leaned in. Um, so one of the things that I've learned is lean in. When, when I became the acting for the, for the FM, it was a scary thought. Um, but like Margaret said, I didn't need to have all of the technical expertise. What I needed to know is how to learn and how to find the experts. And what we bring to the table at this level is the leadership skill, is the building the coalition. It's finding the right people to bring to the table. So I did not need to be the brain. Um, and, and this is how I've been blessed to get here. And kind of relating to what Mobola said is, um, element of it is hard work, is showing that you are capable. Um, it's always knowing your bosses, your sponsors throughout the life, who they can rely on. Um, so always making sure that the right people know who you are and what will you bring to the table. And I think 
that's really what got me to this point of um, having the right relationship, the connection, the hard work, um, always look for challenge, always look, lean in. Um, it's scary, but um, part of it is that challenge that makes you grow. I, I have to say, as I wrote this down in somebody that mentors you, you know, I, I'm going to ask the next question, knowing that if there was a glass ceiling, you'd probably smash through it. But you're comfortable being uncomfortable. All of you are. You go to the hard jobs that you're not sure you can do and you take them because, you know, at the end of that challenge, you're going to be different. You're going to be better. You all talked about teamwork. And if you don't have the answers, surrounding yourself with people that can hold you up and you can hold them up because you all learn together. And so as I think about the, the men and women that are out here, the, 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 that, have, that themselves have careers that they're managing, but also have sons and daughters and daughters and sons. So they want to encourage. Uh, I hope they go back and watch this again if it's available. Okay, so we're going to move to now the question that really is the title is the glass ceiling. And I mentioned that as I, you know, got, got a little bit of background on and looked at the statistics in your profession, um, the pyramid's not quite right. There are more people come, there are more women coming in, but as it goes for different reasons, either self-selection with life balance or institutional or cultural, there are reasons women are either opting out or not putting themselves in the position to complete. You three are fearless. I, I would not want to gunfight with you. Um, <laughs> let's ask you this. Uh, one, fight, I, I'm sure you would win. Other kind um, of fight. Well, I, I have friends that have those skills, so I come armed as well. Um, but yeah, let me ask you this. Um, at what point in at what point in your career did you feel like, wow, this is getting really hard because the system's not fair, or because you had already decided nothing stops me and I'm going to the hardest jobs possible that people won't. That, that, and I'm going to prove myself. Did you hit the glass ceiling? If you hit the glass ceiling, what what did you do to maintain your your positive, your optimism, and your ferociousness? And what advice would you give to a to a young woman, um, to a person who is underrepresented, to say, I feel like I'm being held back because of who I am, not what I can do. What advice would you give them? So, I'm going to start with Margaret on that one. Yeah, it's um, I I did hit the glass ceiling. Um, I won't say where it was not in government. Um, and I I had the you know blinding insight of the obvious that oh it's glass ceiling because you don't see it until you hit it. Um, and. The observation I had, it was less about what I could do in terms of my own career. I was in consulting. My observation was it was how I was in, able to advocate for my people that became problematic. So in consulting, it's all about, you know, the opportunities to work on the the right projects that help your people get promoted. And there were a couple circumstances where how I was advocating for my people was perceived in a certain kind of way because I was a woman. You know, those those ad adjectives started getting used. Um, I actually love, you know, some of the places I've worked, not consulting, but if banks they talk about breaking glass as if it's a bad thing. Like you need to kind of do your work of, you know, I do innovation, right? Without breaking glass. And I've been described as a professional glass breaker, but when there seemed to be too much back spatter for being forceful, being aggressive, being proactive, and it hurt my people, um, that was really uh, viscerally um, uncomfortable for me, particularly when it meant some of the people did or did not get promoted or some of the people did or did not stay with the firm, get laid off. And so I've always been fairly 
you know, I won't say comfortable, but fairly willing to have frank conversations about systemic issues and things around bias, you know, because I firmly believe bias is the the biggest part of the the challenge, not actual discrimination. Um, that people don't realize that they are giving the best opportunities to people most like them. And if if leadership are white men, then you know white men are getting the the most of the best opportunities. You know, so the more I could use data and kind of objective factors to bring that in, um, you know, the better. Um, so yeah. Hopefully that yeah, well, that thank you for that, because I think what you experienced, um, you know, and then how you reattack and you didn't leave the field because you were a leader looking after your people, you realize, OK, this is my experience with this process and this is going to hurt these people's careers. So I've got to figure out a way to get over that obstacle, which I think is advice as a glass breaker myself. Can't get over the wall the first way find another way around, but get over mm -hmm. the wall. So Alayla, what has been your experience if you, when did you realize there was a glass ceiling or with your kind of, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm moving through this. I'm taking nothing stopping me giving my start. Um, you know, when you've, when you've seen it, how have you dealt with it as a leader? So I'm going to kind of combine for time's sake, uh, our third and fourth question. So um, I very much relate also to the comment Margaret made about the bias. Um, I would tell you it's no surprise, you know, Department of Defense um, is a very much of a hierarchical and a male-dominated kind of organization. Um, and there's a lot of work that's being done. So I want to acknowledge that to, you know, promote more of the diversity and inclusion um, but, but one of the things that, um, I also, like I said, you know, I always look inside, um, before, you know, to make sure that, um, I am addressing those, uh, those biases as well, uh, was, um, one, as I tell everybody, speak up, right? It may come across as aggressive, but taking the emotion out of any discussion and having fact-based discussions. Um, and not necessarily react um, to, you know, to um, every uh, kind of perceived, um, uh, I guess, treatment or, or, or you know, uh, interaction with folks. And, and it's been very difficult. It's very difficult, um, you know, when you walk into a room and there is, you know, 40 male, white male, and then there is you. You know, the natural reaction is, uh, you know, feeling uncomfortable and not talking or not speaking. And it, it really takes time to train yourself. As I tell everybody, speak up, take the emotion out and have fact-based discussion and be heard. Um, and it's a challenge, you know, that we go through every day. Um, and, um, you know, it's going to take some time to get over this. And a lot of discussion about it, a lot of training, and quite frankly, being confident. Um, and, and if you're called, you know, aggressive, um, then, uh, you know, I say that's not being aggressive. That is being, hey, passionate and about and what we care about. So standing your ground on being confident in what you're bringing to the table. Yeah, I know. I, I absolutely think that's fantastic advice because at the levels you're at, you're seeing it and you're creating the generation that's coming behind you, filling positions that are going to encounter things. And it's not about getting discouraged, frustrated or quitting the field. It's staying with it and believing in yourself and your people. Um, Mobala, what's your experience, Ben? Was there a moment when, and I loved Margaret's, you know, you don't know it's a glass ceiling because it's invisible, um, had the same exact aha moment years ago when people said, look out for that glass ceiling. Mobala, what, let's, let's kind of move to what advice would you give, um, to a rising and aspiring professional who looks at the three of you and says, yes, I can, but I am experiencing for the first time uh, some feeling that I'm not getting an opportunity, not because of my merit, but because of the group that I, I'm from. 
what would you say, what what advice would you give to them? So first, um, first I'll say, speak up, right? There are a lot of things, and, and as we talk about bias, right? You know, to be frank, everybody's got it. Everybody's got a little bias, right? Um, obviously, you know, there are, because I think, I think we've gone through a phase where, you know, it was like, at some point people knew there was bias, but people, people didn't feel comfortable talking about it. So we would rather not acknowledge it, right? I think we're at a point now where people are acknowledging, right? And if they're not, people need to know. So one is speak up when you, when things like that happen or you view that, have the conversation. Again, take the emotion out of it, but speak up. Um, the second is be confident in who you are. Be confident in what you bring to the table. Um, a lot of times, um, especially females, you know, we have to be, the resume asks for 100%, we have to have 100%, but yet a male with 50% will go in there, apply for whatever job you thought you couldn't or were not capable of, and that person becomes your boss or that person becomes the person who is viewed for that for that position, right? So speak up and if you want something, go for it. You know, even if you're not at 100%, go for it. The other thing I will say is, you know, surround yourself with people, you know, that are taking risks, right? People that are not as calculated, everything has to fall in place and in line. Surround yourself with people that are breaking ceilings, people that are making you know, big decisions. Every time I look back and I get a little, oh my God, I'm not really sure. You know, I look back and I see a lolly and I go, oh, hell yeah, I can do this, you know. And and then there's other people, other women who have paved the way even ahead of us who we all look up to. And that's because, again, you got to think about it. If you don't take that risk, if you don't speak up for yourself, if you don't believe in yourself, then there's nobody that will do that for you. There are just some things that I feel like you have to take, you have to run with but surround yourself with people that when you start to go, oh my God, I'm not sure, they're there for you saying, yes, you can, right? So my advice to you is to know that, know that about yourself. And in everything that you do, be fair, right? As we rise up and as you look at how you wanna progress, be fair to people. That is something that I think around, especially within the accounting consulting world, you know, it's kind of a circle, you know, the network goes around, be fair to people and go after your passion. Um, you know, as you will anything else. Yeah, look, you guys have a flood of questions now. I'm going to do a sound check and ask uh, Simone if you would just type in how much time we have. Um, and I'm just going to take them off the top. So I've got one from for a, a Layla and actually for both. What advice would you give to an international student who is looking for opportunities like this in the United States? Um, easier in the government, easier if going private sector and finding way in. Any thoughts on that? Okay, I um, I can I can speak to that. Um, so um, there is an element of I mean, of course, I started with the private sector and then joined the the government, um, and some of that also, Mary, has to do. Um, with, uh, you know, which area of government and whether, you know, a security clearance is required if it's international, um, you know, students are not having the, uh, so there, there is that element of it. Um, I, I, I would say in our career, quite frankly, having the perspective of um, both private sector and government has been very helpful for me. Um, is not a you know right or wrong answer as where you start. But what I always tell people is don't get comfortable. Do not sit in the same job for 20 years. You have to move around and you have to get exposure. And as you know, Mary, in the military, you're forced to move. In the civilian side, unless you kind of, you know, get after it, there's not much, you know, uh, opportunities for movement per se. So it comes to the individual itself. Okay, thank you for that. And yes, I think uh, to the international student, I think that's great advice because there are some agencies that, you know, the clearance becomes an issue and it's not possible. So just get good advice. So here's a related question. Um, and I'm going to just, I'll throw it out to Margaret. 
um, tips you had in finding mentors? Because it sounds like um, what I loved about Mabala's answers is you made sure you had people that held you accountable for your potential. If you were getting weak knee, they were going to bat you upside the head and you were going to go after the job. That's a mentor of types. But Margaret, from the in your career, both in the decision maybe to go to OMB, mentors, how important have they been and how did you find them? Um, I think it's a great question. So throughout my life, I've, I've gravitated to people who could teach me something that I want to know. Um, and usually it's a skill that's a non-obvious skill. Um, and I might find that I need help with that through practice and failure. Um, so one thing early on, I actually, a business school classmate of mine, I just thought was world-class at delivering bad news. Um, nobody likes to deliver bad news, but it is often part of your job to deliver bad news. And it's actually a part of being fair. One of the reasons um, both women and people of color um have what are called blind spots uh, more often is they don't get as much feedback about those blind spots because people are either afraid of making them cry or afraid of them getting angry. And so, you know, I've picked mentors that were good at giving bad, you know, bad news or mentors that were good at networking or had a job I wanted. And to me, I don't even think about it formally as mentorship. I think about it as a network that adds to my capabilities. So yeah. something I will say yeah. that's super important is keeping relationships, whether the, the person is rising or falling, including when people get laid off, has been critically important. So I won't know where I'm going to find the best network of people, you know, the, the way I ended up in government was someone who I think, you know, at various times in our relationship, I was kind to when maybe other people weren't kind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love the idea of every, every mentor has a season. And every relationship can be important. And if you really pay attention to the gifts that different people have, people are always, they're generally willing to help if you reflect that and provide help back. And maintaining your relationships, super important. Okay, I'm going to transition. There's about a billion questions, and they're all great. Um, so I, this is a really interesting one. Um, what advice do you have for someone that works with leadership that they don't respect. So you're kind of a bad boss and shows favoritism to somebody who's like a problem child. So in other words, you're not in the best, you don't have the best situation. It's not tremendously inspiring, but it's a part of your life right now. One of you think about maybe that time you didn't have the best boss situation and share, how did you manage not to blow yourself up, but to make it work for you? So let me just ask who'd like to take that one. Okay. Well, Bola, you have a bad boss. Why don't you take that? My <laughs> boss, my boss is on the line, so I can't really talk. <laughs> I, I would, I would say that something I learned as a consulting trick. Um, it's not even a trick, but it's it, it it's an orientation has helped me. Um, something called develop deep regard. So whether it's a client who's a pain in the neck, you know, your boss's boss who seems irrational, like remember that they are human and there's a reason they're there and try to support the reason they're there and not make it about how they make me feel, but about what there's a reason they got that position and they may not be perfectly suited to that position and they may have all kinds of failings as a human, but the more I think about them as a human, the, the better I'm able to support them. And the example that I first learned it for was a client 
we were trying to make the appointment sister system at Kaiser Permanente more efficient. So if I called up, you know, you wouldn't tell me you, your appointment is like three years from now. And there was a neonatologist who was an absolute expletive and seemed to be like just in the way of everything. And when I played it forward and, and kind of developed deep regard, I realized he's worried about babies dying. He's worried that what I'm doing could ruin the care for the fragilest humans. And it just helps me, you know, respect is kind of a charged word, but I, an appreciation for why that person is there. Yeah. Love that answer because you, you are maintaining who you are and bringing your best and also showing empathy and trying to figure out what's motivating and how you can help that person. So love that answer. Okay. Uh, this is another really, these questions, by the way, guys, are just great. You should, the group that's asking questions, you should just go together to all of them and just continuing to pepper folks. So what advice that, what, what, and this, we've all experienced this as senior leaders. What is the advice that you would give for those who are talented, but choose for life's reasons not to go up, you know, not to pursue continued promotion um, because their experience reflected in the question is it can often be looked upon negatively. So how do you, if you're that person that knows from a life's balance perspective, now's not the time. It's not that I'm not motivated, but I got a whole life outside that I need to pay attention to. I'm going to do my job and do it well, but um, I'm not moving up the ceiling. How do I communicate to my hard charging bosses who, after you guys get done with this panel, are going to take over the world? So who wants to take that question? I'll, I can take that one because I have I have quite a few people that I sometimes want to shake and go, you're so ready for this, right? And, um, and I think, to be honest with you, as leaders, if they're good performers and they're not ready, um, the best thing you can do is support and always be there, right? Whether that's giving them new opportunities, um, whether that's helping them um, understand, right, how much more impact they can make. Because sometimes, um, sometimes people are, in some cases, comfortable, maybe because they're, you know, circumstances outside and it just helps them kind of balance their life. Sometimes that's what people are going through. But there are other times where, like I said, people get scared sometimes of the unknown, right? So it's like I have this, you know, everybody knows me as a SME here. I'm really good. You know, I, I'm respected. Um, but I think the last thing we should do as leaders is label them as not not, you know, like some of us have the drive. We just have to keep going. Like for me, it's a waste of time if I sit somewhere and I'm not moving. It's just like, what am I doing? So, but some, some people need a little bit more time, a little bit more encouragement, a little bit more, you know, structure to help them see other things and how impactful they could be. So I would say as, uh, as leaders, we should be supportive. We should have more of those conversations with them. Um, check in because again, if, if they're really good people and deliver, um, they may just need a little extra push. And, and to be honest, frankly, there are also some people who are just comfortable where they are. But I think it's important as leaders to invest a little bit of time in those type of relationships and see how far you can help the person or maybe you could um, get them passionate about something different. Yeah. And yeah. I think, yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, because the other side of that coin is it's not necessarily super healthy for an organization to have a whole function or a whole sphere of influence be captive to only one way of king. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I am trying to do modernization activities and innovation, the notion that it has never been done differently and cannot be done differently is one of the, the biggest invisible barriers and so I do think what Mabola said is really important. You can have a lifestyle that works, you know, in your employment environment by being honest, frank, and open. But it's also important to remember the employer has needs too. And part of the reason the military rotates people is they don't want that entrenched ownership 
Mm -hmm. prideful innovation. And so there has to be a balance. And it's important for us to push people to learn and grow and be capable of change because that's what the workforce, you know, I, I, I was the acting director of OPM for 11 months. The single biggest barrier we have to change in government and driving efficiency is that kind of entrenched mindset. Yeah, and, and I so so we'll just the cap on that is um, you know, understand the motivation of the person. And so whoever asked the question, if you're not moving and you're not moving for reasons, don't be part of the stasis that 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 understand why it is and ensure that you're embracing that innovate innovative mindset. Um, because otherwise it's probably not a good thing that you stay. Okay, we actually, believe it or not, have about 10 more questions, but we are at that point where we want to ask the last question, um, which isn't the fun question, but it's the serious one. So we've got about um, six minutes. I'm going to ask each of you to take just a couple. And I want to ask, what are each of you doing at your organizations um, to empower or help women or other disenfranchised employees um, to have your experience and to break through the glass ceiling? Now, for some of this will be redundant, but... What are those main themes that as you approach your life as a leader, how do you get up every day and kind of make a difference? Um, let me start where we started off the last time. And well, let me, let me go with Mabola and then I'm going to wrap back to your boss. <laughs> sure. So, um, so from my perspective, I'll talk about a few things. And I think maybe Alali will maybe pile on more because um, as you know, I'm still a little new to the Navy. So a lot of what I'm doing right now is kind of assessing our needs, talking about succession planning, um, identifying where we have needs and looking at which ways we could, um, you know, mentorship programs and things like that, that I think we're working on formalizing um, to encourage women, to encourage diversity, you know, different, um, you know, cultural kind of, you know, um, different cultural mindsets as well in order to kind of bring in the right folks. But I will say um, prior to obviously joining the Navy, I, would as, I was at OSD. And I know one of the things that we had talked about working with our uh, HR folks really looking to not just the workforce today, but also the people that we're bringing in. Where are we doing recruiting? How are we doing those things? What schools are we going if we're doing college recruiting? Um, also looking at, you know, what firms, what skill set, you know, that was a long time ago when we said, hey, we, you know, this is a CFO shop, you only need accountants. Well, that's, you got to broaden that today, right? As we talk about data, how many people are going to school for, you know, data, data analytics, how many women are in that stuff, you know? And so there, there were some, a lot of things that I think on the government side, um, and as I say government, I speak specifically just, you know, wearing the OSD hat that I was, at the time, and I think there were a lot of programs we were working to to kind of um, expand a little bit and open up the aperture to, to really make sure that we're getting to the right people, starting from not just, you know, current, you know, current leadership and how we promote people, but even the future, right, generation of people that we bring in um, outside the government that we bring in and how we look at that um, hiring structure and recruiting structure to help do some of that. So I know that internally within the Navy, we are working right now on a, especially within the FM, FMNC, we're working right now on getting, putting together a formal rotational um, experience, rotational program, a mentorship program for all of the SES within FMNC. We have an element of mentorship as part of how we are rated, right? And so not somebody within your chain, but somebody outside so that we have that you know, cross-functional um, experience that we can share and help to mentor people and how we target um, those two um, minorities and, and make sure that we get the diverse crowd that we need in helping to um, kind of fill the spots as we go forward. So thank you so much because I think that's a comprehensive answer and those of us who are watching the services respond to this challenge um, and with the new Secretary of Defense that has quite a bit of passion about this. This could be a really unbelievable time. So I'm not going to have time for, for Margaret, who works in a firm where the way we get at this is we declare we're going to be gender equal by 2025 with half a million people, full stop. So the, uh, measure what you seek to do and be very bold about it. 
Alayla, you just listened to Mobala, who I know you're proud of. Um, was there anything she missed? Or is there anything that you're particularly passionate about in your own personal leadership style of making sure that there is a generation of Alales that are going to come after uh, and be your legacy? And that's our last question. Yep. Nope. Thank you. Um, one of the things that um, it was important to me as I took on this job is that, you know, for every organization, the first thing that we do, we talk about mission, vision, and our goals. But we don't spend a lot of time talking about our values and norms. So one of the things that we put together was um, a listing of we actually got employees, uh, as I call them, the employee engagement uh, team put together to develop series of values and norms, and one of which was diversity and inclusion and respect. And I want to expand that beyond just the gender and race, because the other thing that matters to me, we have a lot of different minority groups, but also I want to acknowledge the diversity of opinion. Um, so um, we established that as kind of the foundation of these are the rules we go by. We have series of engagement at uh, and uh, her peers where um, we're having direct engagement with the employees and I want them to speak up and feel that they are included at the employee level that we, we listen to them. She mentioned also the mentoring, the shadowing program. I love when some junior folks reach out to me directly and they want to shadow. So I'm establishing actual opportunities where folks of the diverse group or in any gender or race that could come and spend the day with us and see how we interact, what we do, uh, rotational programs, you know, expanding their, uh, their abilities and putting them in a place where they are presenting, um, they're, they're leading a project. Um, so those are some of the series of um, activities that we've put in place in FMNC. So you're really attacking this to change the culture. And, you know, I think um, we're at, unfortunately, ladies and leaders, we're at the end of what has been just an incredible masterclass from three amazing leaders. Uh, we talk in Accenture about the culture of equality and having the freedom to come to work and be who you are and to excel. And you are creating respect or people as human beings who want to contribute as parts of teams, that everybody's important, everybody's ideas matter. And we start with that basic premise of treating people with dignity and respect and embracing the potential that they've been given. Um, ladies, on behalf of this audience, um, I can't think of a better panel. I wish in my life I had run into some of you, although I'd been a little bit afraid to get advice from you because whatever you tell me to do, I would have done. Um, I hope that you understand how proud um, your profession is of the example that you bring every day to the workforce um, and the leadership you show in, in, in making time today to share what you've learned to help others, to inspire others, to empower them, and to know that there is a place for their kind of leadership. Um, in this government and in, in, in our country. So on behalf of uh, this great conference, thank you, ladies. It was a pleasure getting to know you today. And I hope we'll see each other again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us.